Necessity as the mother of invention, the rise of the accidental entrepreneur. Ebehiji Momo is country manager and area business head West Africa at MasterCard. Based in Nigeria, she is responsible for advancing the brand presence in West Africa. Yana Aspeling is a South African artist, designer and entrepreneur. Her primary avenue of art sales is through commissions, and she sells her work both nationally and internationally. Temwam Siska is the founder of tourism startup Orion Malawi. Based in Blantyre, she enjoys dealing with challenges associated with operating at a geographical and cultural distance. Josephine Anan Ankoma is Group Executive Commercial Banking at EcoBank. Having joined EcoBank Ghana in 1992 as Treasury Officer, Josephine has over 25 years of experience at the bank. Yeah, really excited to be having this conversation. It kind of leads or follows through quite nicely from uh, what Gugu was discussion, discussing in her previous panel with her speakers about the number of women that had lost their jobs in this time. And so I'm speaking about uh, the number of women that lost their jobs and did something about it because they could. So we did see the pandemic, seeing a lot of uh, individuals who um, had jobs, losing them, being fired or either being uh, furloughed. And this not only only happened here on the continent but also across the world so they could no longer resist uh, the uh, tried and tested but they had to pivot into becoming a forced entrepreneurs as it were coming out of paid employment and starting their own businesses so these are the moonlighters the hustlers and also the involuntary entrepreneurs that emerged from the cracks and they deserve mention as they did plow on in innovative ways that kept value chains alive so I am really excited to be kicking off and I think that first of all uh, good afternoon ladies I know International Women's Day has passed but happy International Women's Month I think we can still say that I'd like to start this conversation uh, with the accidental entrepreneurs and really get an understanding from their re lived reality what things were like on the ground for them in the past uh, two years as the pandemic did disrupt their business and force them into pivoting into something else so Yana I'm really interested in your story. So in South Africa, many people would know that uh, we couldn't come to you anymore because the hairdressers were uh, regarded as non-essential. Uh, many of us became hairdressers of our own, and not, probably not as good as you, but nonetheless, you had your cash flow cut as a result of the lockdowns and the bans. And in this time, I understand that you pivoted from hair to art. So take us through that journey. I think I need to start my journey. Um, I studied fine arts before I went into hairdressing. Um, I wasn't quite ready to be a hairdresser uh, or an artist um, when I completed my studies and then moved into hairdressing. Um, loved it. Um, stopped doing art for about 14 years. And in 2017, I started picking up my art brushes again, my paint brushes, and really just painting um, more like a hobby. Um, and then when COVID hit and the sun on doors closed, I took my hobby, um, I think firstly to maybe keep me sane in the time of COVID. Um, and I started painting more and more um, um, for my own mental health, keeping me sane. And then um, I realized that it could actually become a business. So, um, yeah, it was something that, that came full circle for me, um, where one business was really um, forced to shut down, another one was born. Um, yeah, and um, I, I, actually had to choose uh, last year between the two. I could not manage both anymore. Um, I'm so blessed and I'm today a full-time artist and my hobby um, has now become my full-time career and um, I'm, I'm very happy about that. No, congratulations to you and I'm wondering if the uh 
the artwork that we are seeing behind you is is yours and if it is it's very beautiful but i want to stay with you yana and just talk about that inflection point that moment that you realized that a hobby that you were using to help keep you mentally sane uh, in a period where we couldn't really do anything else that moment where you realized you could commercialize and make money out of it how did you get going from there on? I mean, did you uh, have uh, financial assistance or other forms of support to get your art business off the ground? So because it was a hobby, I luckily, before lockdown, had, I had canvases stocked in my storeroom at home. Um, my hubby actually asked me, uh, a year prior to that, listen, are you ever going to use these canvases or should we throw them out? I had paint, I had everything. Um, so when lockdown hit and everything went into a hard lockdown, retail stores were shut down um, and you could not even go out and buy art supplies. Um, I had all of that already at home. Um, I was fortunate enough that um, my husband um, could help me initially just um, keep my doors of my salon open um, and um, I could start just creating art, um, like I said, to keep sane in the time. But um, as I started posting and sharing my work on social media, I was so surprised with the response I received. Um, the ones you're actually seeing behind me are um, artworks that that actually was locked down artworks, and I called them the Birds and Bloom range. Um, I think I needed to um, depict nature and the beauty and color and things that were uplifting to people, not just for myself. But as my audience grew, I also saw a bigger need for people to see beautiful visual images, um, to forget about these bubbles we were stuck in at home, and also loved ones getting sick and, and watching numbers go up and realizing that there was really no end to to the pandemic and that it would have a long-term knock-on effect on businesses. So um, my audience my audience grew um, with me and supported my art and was buying my art off the easel, saying to me, don't worry about shipping it now. I know you guys can't ship anything now, but please keep it for me when you can. I was getting orders out of Canada. I sent um, artworks to India, Bangalore. I, um, I've literally sent across the world, and it was, yeah, you know, something small that just bloomed into something beautiful. Right, right. Got it. Uh, thanks so much for sharing this story. Uh, your uh, painting, I think, are uh, really uh, bringing a lot of joy to the viewers who are uh, tuned in uh, with us and who are logged in uh, virtually as uh, well. Uh, interesting that uh, there is an element of a supportive husband that was involved in that equation and social media, but I think we'll cover those uh, topics, particularly the social media towards the latter end of the discussion. Temwa, I want to come to you now because yours was a business that was also impacted uh, by the uh, pandemic we couldn't travel anywhere domestically internationally it, it it couldn't happen because we were told uh, when you move around the virus moves around so i imagine that again your business came to a standstill so talk to us about your transformation uh, journey and how you pivoted into accidental entrepreneurship from tourism in which you initially started Thank you very much. So um, when I was initially planning for my business, what I thought I would be able to pivot to in a time of low season, low business, um, would be to, into conferencing. But unfortunately, my entire industry was absolutely uh, decimated by the pandemic. Fortunately, um, what I found was that I was able to reposition myself more as a consultant within the industry because this break in travel, internationally specifically, um, allowed us 
some breathing space to be able to invest in the businesses along the value chain within tourism. So this was time for us to prepare for whatever life would look like after the pandemic, after we've come to a position where we're able to contain um, the virus, the spread of the virus, and also treat it. So when people come back to Malawi, who are they going to meet? Who are they going to interact with? And how have we used this time wisely? So I've been really lucky to be able to work with government bodies and other funding agencies to work on training people within um, other people in S other small SMEs, um, artisans as well. They've also been very hard hit because there's a lot of people who are making handicrafts who rely on international visitors specifically and just sort of trying to re-embrace the domestic tourist as well, um, the domestic traveler. Outside of tourism itself, I had to say, well, in the low periods when I'm not consulting, I'm not facilitating a workshop, I'm not interacting with these SMEs, what else can I do? So I then went into slow fashion and I started to um, sell thrifted items because I just felt like, it was something where I could be really creative and put all my skills to use, but really um, also just be a little bit indulgent in a time that was so difficult. Right. And this year, I've gone on to get go into farming, so it just keeps going and growing. Yeah, no, uh, you put the H in hustle uh, from uh, conferencing <laughs> uh, that didn't quite work out uh, to now consulting across your tourism value chain and slow fashion and now even farming there's a whole lot but i'd like to also understand from you your support along the way and the reason why i'm asking about support is that in the pivot uh, i had a few uh, entrepreneur friends and the challenge that they found was the financial support in trying out a new venture during this time uh, what was your experience and what kind of support did you uh, have along your journey so um, I can say that I've benefited well from the organizations that have gone on to employ me. So paid work is really um, how I'm able to continue doing this more so than uh, my own capital. My savings have helped me keep a roof over my head, but in terms of accessing small grants, it's really quite onerous, it's very difficult. But I can say that my family, uh, my family and friends have helped me and doing the paid work for the consultancies has been everything. Within the businesses themselves, some, some money has been coming in. But as a startup, as any person in any startup will be able to tell you, it's very difficult to make a profit in those early times. And this time is no exception. Got you. Ebehije, ma'am, lovely to see you again, albeit virtually, or rather say e-meet you again. Uh, just uh, can you give us a bit of a macro view, a bird's eye view uh, of the level of accidental entrepreneurism activity that uh, you have witnessed, uh, just based on the data that MasterCard was able to draw? Um, speak to the continent and uh, feel free to also touch on uh, what has happened in other parts of the world. All right, thank you so much. It'd be really nice to meet you again. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, in 2022, in 2021, I beg your pardon, we've been looking at the, the findings that we have with our MasterCard uh, Index for Women Entrepreneur. What we have seen that, first of all, this index provides insight into factors that drives or inhibits uh, advancement of women in 65 economics. What we have seen is that there have been a global rise of the accidental entrepreneur, like you rightly said. And what we've seen in this rise is that necessity-driven entrepreneurial activities in 37 out of the 65 uh, economies that were studied, we've seen that definitely that accidental uh, entrepreneur in our data. But what is also interesting, bringing it back home in Sub-Saharan Africa, Nine of this, nine of the SSA market, the Sub-Saharan Africa that was studied, we've seen that five of it actually had that female necessity-driven entrepreneurship coming out really clearly. For example, in Madagascar, we saw an increase of about 49%. In South Africa, where you are right now, we saw an increase of about 28%. But what is also interesting in that five, four out of that nine Sub-Saharan Africa, they were actually... Um, uh, women-owned business that are driven, not necessarily by necessity driven, but with women-owned businesses driven by opportunities they have. And we have seen this in a couple of markets in Nigeria, 
in Botswana and in Ghana. So clearly there are um, there are necessity driven uh, entrepreneurship happening across uh, uh, here in Sub-Saharan Africa. But when you look at the necessity driven women entrepreneur, why does it start in the first place? This starts when they have no other means for work. And I was listening to Jana, uh, all the things that she had done because of uh, this same necessity driven uh, opportunities. But this can also do, be due to a push factor. And so when we are looking at the push factor, we are looking at factors that are um, uh, things like there are no other options to have labor force. There are no labor force options. But when we also we are also seeing women who are hitting the glass ceiling, facing or facing gender discrimination in the workplace, or personal responsibility as simple as caring for the family. So you see them go into businesses that are necessity driven. But what is clear is that opportunity driven uh, women start business due to the pull factors, such as capitalizing on a, on a perceived market opportunity, as opposed to finding no other option for whatever it is that they want to do. So for us, in the, in what we have seen is that that increase, there have been an increase indeed for the accidental entrepreneur, uh, just to put it in your words, Vivian. Oh, wonderful. Thanks uh, so much for those insights. And uh, Josephine perhaps also share some uh, insights that uh, have come through the uh, doors of Ecobank. I know that uh, you do run the uh, gender financing program there, Elevate. Uh, what kind of um, activity by way of this accidental entrepreneur uh, have you uh, witnessed? Uh, does it tell you what uh, MasterCard has seen in its data? But I suppose more importantly, how successful have these accidental entrepreneurs uh, been after starting? Um, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here, Fifi. And I, I, I want to align myself with uh, um, the comments of the previous speaker. We've seen, you know, these accidental entrepreneurs spring up all across our, our markets. And if you permit me, I'll just give a few practical examples uh, that we've had, for example, in our markets. In you know, my, my sister, for example, my personal example, you know, she's a banker working in the US. And during the pandemic, you know, she ran with her passion for food and set up a puff puff uh, business. And it's now packaging, you know, do donut packaging uh, donut mixes and, and selling that across the US. Um, in Nigeria, you know, we've seen a, a company that was involved in, you know, cocktails and drinks, setting up pharmac pharmacy shops. In Ghana, we've seen a, a high-end, you know, company that was involved in fashion, you know, pivoting into, you know, um, PPEs and medical scraps. So yes, you know, we've seen a lot of these businesses uh, and, and, and come up. And from, from where we sit, you know, we, we see, you know, a lot of potential in terms of these businesses being sustainable. And, and much as these businesses started off as, should I say, you know, necessity or needs must businesses, they are gradually transforming into opportunity, you know, opportunity entrepreneurs, because now they are making money out of it. They see that what they're doing is meeting, you know, needs, practical needs across the continent. And so they are becoming more formalized. And this is where Elevate by Ecobank comes in, where we are looking to provide not only financial, but non-financial support to these women uh, businesses that have started up you know, across, across Africa. We started Elevate by Ecobank, let's say, um, about a year ago. And since we started, we've onboarded over 15,000 women-owned and women-led businesses across Africa. Sure. Uh, we've given out over $100 million in loans. And we're continuing to do this. We're not only focusing on providing finance, but also providing them with non-financial support, especially in the areas of training. And I believe that we'll have opportunities to talk more about this as we go along. So yes, um, there have been great opportunities, and we see these businesses picking up and growing across Africa. Yes, but I want to stick with the area of uh, finance and access to finance because a lot of the entrepreneurs that I have the uh, opportunity to engage with often cite this as one of the biggest challenge not only to start uh, but to also scale. And so perhaps I'm going to stick with the financiers for now because I want insights from you on perhaps what some uh, female-owned uh, businesses that knock on your doors are not doing right or could do better to get more of a yes uh, from yourself. So Ibi, you're just coming back to you. I mean, I know MasterCard is not a central bank. I mean, if you could help as many businesses and print the cash, uh, you would, but you can't. So you have to be very discreet in who you uh, approve and who you don't. So can you just share some insights for the woman on this uh, call as to uh, what could make their businesses more 
uh, support ready or attractive for financiers looking to lend a helping hand? Thank you, Fifi. So when we look at that, when we look at the support that um, is really required from women entrepreneurs, what, what is it that they need? One of the things, and I always like to share some of the statistics that we have based on the insights that we have from our um, MasterCard Index for Women Entrepreneurs. We've seen that 37% of women reporting access to financial services in Sub-Saharan Africa, compared to the 48% that we have seen in May. And creating programs that focus on closing this gap has been a very critical part of our efforts. And so we're leveraging company best assets like our tools, technology, insights, funding and expertise just to connect women to possibilities that will help them unlock the potentials over a long period of time. So when we look at MasterCard, what, what are we doing? We are creating digital marketplace, for example, so that the smaller holder women farmer can get paid fully for their crops. Because if you look at during the era of the pandemic, creating those digital marketplaces became very critical for people who couldn't move about. It is also giving women entrepreneurs greater access to training and capital. Uh, it is it's helping all families pay their school fees and also ensuring that people in remote areas are keeping uh, lights on the uh, keeping their lights on. One of the examples I really like to share was what we did working with a few of our partners, where uh, we were able to customize innovative solutions to connect women with the training capital and services that they need to help unlock their economic potential. The example here that is really um, uh, very close to my heart is the partnership between MasterCard and Unilever. And if you've heard of uh, uh, Jazaduka, which really may fill up your store, it was a step of its kind in a digital lending platform in Kenya, one of the African countries, where this platform sort of track how much a store owner has purchased over time and then combines that data with MasterCard analytics. The results are used therefore to help provide microcredit eligibility with recommendation to our partners. And in this case, it was Kenya Commercial Bank, who then were able to provide a credit line and then using alternative creative metrics to demonstrate credit worthiness. And that is really important because to your point, um, Fifi, and earlier made by the previous speaker, finance is a major, major issue when it comes to women entrepreneurship. And then also, when we look at the, the, the story of our index, the MIWI, the importance of financial inclusion then coming. How do we then bring women? Because when we are talking about financing today, people seem to just stop at the, uh, at the places or area where people have even the, the slightest access to financing. But we're looking at financial inclusion. How do we bring sure. in those women in the former economy or bring in all the other women in the villages, which was what Jazaduka did in, uh, in Kenya? Sure. Uh, yeah, I agree with you uh, 100% because, I mean, uh, you look at entrepreneurship and uh, these guys have amazing, amazing ideas. And when I am using the word guys, I'm, I'm meaning it's gender neutral. Amazing ideas, but of course, it's uh, more than just an amazing idea that uh, will get uh, a financier to part with, to part with their in investments. Uh, you touched, Abhijay, on uh, some of the softer skills, you know, the training uh, that was done. In fact, if I just uh, reflect on uh, my makeup artist, uh, she's uh, pivoted into makeup. And uh, she said, you know, she, in fact, she's really good, but uh, she said she hates accounting and she hates administration. And of course, these are also some of the softer skills that are required. But if I just move over to your colleague in the sector, uh, Josephine, as you do uh, flesh out the uh, training that is done is at, at, at EcoBank, uh, perhaps can you just also share insights uh, with us on uh, where the uh, areas of weakness in some of the businesses that do approach you uh, in terms of the non-financial uh, support are uh, presently. And that question is targeted to Josephine. Yeah, uh, so what we're doing, um, what, what we've noticed is that we need to take, have a 300, 360 degree approach when we're looking to supporting women. And that is really what our Elevate program is about. So yes, there is a problem of access to finance and how we are tackling that, especially looking at women because they don't have an adequate collateral. You know, sometimes they are not as well educated, uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, so, and so are, are not able to articulate, you know, uh, their business plans properly or sometimes, you know, um, they, 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 they don't have financial records for you to lend um, on the back of. So how we lend to them, you know, to help to improve the financial, I mean, I mean, side of it is to lend to them against cash flows. 
you know, so we know that you are supplying money, to, I mean, a product, for example, to a Unilever, we bank Unilever. So then we, we get Unilever to assign the flows to us. And so we're able to lend to you with minimal co collateral. And in addition to, to this, we are partnering with other DFIs who are providing us with credit guarantee schemes so that we can lend to them on favorable terms without asking them to bring in collateral. But dealing with finance is just one, one, part, one piece of the pie. The other bit is, is how do you ensure that that business is continuing and is sustainable? And that is where our training program comes in. Last Last year, for example, um, we're working with our Ecobank Academy. We're able to train um, eight 450 um, MSMEs, 30% of which of, of which were women, in eight of our markets in, through virtual sessions, and we took them through various um, uh, training training programs. And at the end of that program, you know, we had qualifying pa participants who then were, were, were able to give money to 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 lend. I mean, to, to support their businesses. We have partnered with Google, for example, to, to help to expand market access because there's one thing producing the product, but like my, my colleague said, how do you get the, 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 the goods to the market? So we, we, we are creating free websites with them, working together with Google and Africa 118, and also ensuring that they are on their Google My Business platform so that if you are looking for a, a makeup artist near me or a hairdresser near me, they easily pop up. And that expands the market access and the number of customers that we have to deal with you know and we, we are also we've also worked with uh, microsoft is another one of our partners you know to to provide digital training to over fifty thousand msmes 30 sure. percent of these were women sure. across the market and to uh, to our elevate program we are currently partnering with the um global business schools network you know to create an african business w women's leadership academy that is looking to promote leadership and boost the confidence of women so that they can progress and 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 you know grow up or grow their businesses so we, we want to this holistic approach finance and not going beyond financing to ensure that these businesses remain sustainable sure uh, thanks so much for that and you do mention market access and of course market access also being another hindrance to uh, scaling up but let's let's hear from the uh, entrepreneurs themselves and yana what you did mention is the fact that social media actually helped you scale up that uh, improved your uh, level of reach but uh, just based on your experience and perhaps even the experience of some of your um, fellow colleagues in business who tried adventures and perhaps didn't achieve as much success as 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 you have give us the perspective of the entrepreneur on what it is that you guys need to not only be sustainable but also to scale your businesses um i think that the entrepreneur um first of all we need um support from the families from our families from our colleagues um we need maybe collaborations between um, um females um to inspire us and push our boundaries for me it was definitely partnering up and um, having an investor that also now believes in taking my art to the next level and um, creating functional art. Um, so that for me, um, I think also um, supplier support, people upping your skill, learning more um, from um, people that you network with um is 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 great for for business growth all right uh Temo, uh, your uh, take on uh, support uh, what is it that you as an entrepreneur uh, entrepreneur need or perhaps you can even speak on behalf of uh the uh fellow uh people that move in your circle other female entrepreneurs in terms of their areas of need um so i mean to put it simply what i would love is the trampoline I need a trampoline from my family and I also need a trampoline from my financiers. I need to be able to bounce back whenever I come into the setback. Um, that means that I need multiple opportunities to access funding. I need access funding that is long term and in large amounts to enable me to scale. But I also need that support from my family and my community, people who are committed to buying local, buying from someone they know and doing that on an ongoing basis. 
All right, thanks so much for that. And I think that we've received the perspectives of both uh, camps, as it were, the uh, wonderful people with the ideas uh, that uh, can uh, potentially uh, create more jobs and uh, give people, uh, more people, uh, a sense of livelihoods, as well as the uh, companies that are, uh, you know, looking to stand more on the front line in uh, terms of providing uh, the support that uh, can uh, marry the two agendas. And it has been wonderful to hear uh, in terms of the uh, thoughts that have been shared by both uh, Josephine and Ebihije about the holistic approach that companies are taking right now to support entrepreneurs across the entire value chain beyond just funding, but looking at that access and looking at all the other uh, skills that are required to make a wonderful uh, entrepreneurship uh, cocktail.